Do you? I would say we're going to go forward to Nikos and Aki's presentation, looking very much forward to the innovation and the relationship, relational aspects of skill. And uh, so, yeah, Nikos already. So you can see my screen? Uh, yes. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you, Nico. So, good morning or good afternoon. I don't know what time really now. Um, uh, and thanks to, to the, all the organizers, especially to Constance and uh, Maya, for inviting us to do this. It's good to, to be found even online. It's good to be active in these difficult uh, moments. And actually, this kind of um, uh, corona situation has given us the opportunity to meet more often than usually uh, uh, through Zoom and through all these kind of things. So today's presentation is a presentation, a uh, joint presentation, of course, with Agis Boomers, a professional goldsmith, uh, researcher of ancient technologies and currently visiting artist at the Harvard Center for Hellenic Studies. And of course, uh, it is a study that could not have been made uh, uh, without Agis. Perhaps it could not have been made without me as well, I don't know, but, uh, but it is something that really, uh, I, mean, I speak on behalf of, of both. Innovation, the relation aspects of skill. Now, uh, skill uh, is at the center of, the, of any discussion concerning technical knowledge, as we already saw. And uh, quite often, uh, it is uh, described as a given set of manual and mental dexterity. And I, I agree with, uh, with Nadia that we may not need strict definitions, but at least we need some description of what we're talking about and, and with uh, Michael as well. So uh, up to now, it is mostly taken as a given set of manual and mental sometimes dexterities that is acquired with different uh, degrees of success by craftsmen, skilled craftsmen, amateurs, masters, and so on and so forth. So in a way, it is considered as an external thing, as an external quality, external to the craftsman, something which is self-sustained and context-free. But skills are uh, given, and they are either well acquired or not well acquired. And uh, as we have discussed quite uh, in the uh, past two days, they are mostly uh, um, related with manual or bodily dexterities. And this is related to recent research, which focuses a lot on making us practice, mostly the sense of Marcel Morse than. Okay. Uh, but which, which gives emphasis to the habitual, on the embodied uh, uh, action, on the non-cognitive aspects of technical knowledge, also known as the motor know-how in the past, and more recently as embodied cognition. Now, an interesting thing in this research is the parallels we make with other embodied activities. The most common, uh, especially in educational literature, is with uh, music playing and sports uh, learning. And today, Mark made this interesting thing with a uh, uh, parallelism with excavation as well. Uh, but one way or, or another, this is useful because it shows that, okay, skill doesn't belong to a special category, okay? It, it has to do with everything that is learned through embodied practices, from walking to, to, to speaking to everything. But it also makes us, uh, a lot of uh, speakers, show the, uh, a virtual dichotomy between mind and body which is, of course, criticized by Ingold as a reduction of the technical to the mechanical. I'm not using uh, Ingold because I have to, but it's a nice description. And Nadia has just done a few minutes uh, ago the same kind of criticism. Uh, of course, uh, half and more than half a century uh, before, 70 years before, uh, McQueen has described in a very simple uh, way uh, skill as a complex of mental and physical achievements, in which manual skill plays only a part. And this is simple, less, not unnecessarily over-theorized, as we, we tend to do. But he made also an interesting remark that craftsmen uh, must have a propensity for meeting changing situations adequately. So what actually McQueen said with this sentence is that skill is something that's related to the context. So a craftsman has to be able to change because conditions will change. And he meant condition of, 
of his working. So uh, we would like to pursue the, this further and today discuss about the relational aspect of skill. Uh, to discuss, to, to show that skill acquires meaning by the context of production. There is no any given set of skills. The skill is defined every time by the context. And we will also argue that skill, or what we what, what we understand at least uh, as uh, uh, skill in past writings, can have very different meanings in the context of training and apprenticeship, and in the context of innovation. And we'll try to show how this can be uh, approached or traced in archaeology. Uh, if we had time, but unfortunately we cannot do such a theoretical discussion now, uh, we would like to speak about the concept of, of relational habitus, which has been developed at the area of educational psychology. Uh, but, okay, I just give you here the, the um, uh, reference and uh, uh, you can read. The main topic is that relational habitus is something that has to do, of course, with repeated embodied actions, but uh, it, it describes that skill is uh, defined through intersubjective relations and processes, uh, which are continually, continuously changing. So we'll speak first about the context of uh, apprentices, apprenticeships and training. Of course, it's not easy in archaeology to identify training pieces, but sometimes uh, it happens. Uh, perhaps the best example is uh, the site of Aphrodisias in Asia Minor, where uh, um, the uh, American school, if I'm not wrong, yeah, has uh, uh, identified the sculptor's workshop, the Roman sculptor's workshop. They have studied this very well, and they have reconstructed it uh, in the way that you can see in this uh, picture. Now, uh, uh, that this is a workshop we know because there are tools, uh, there are materials, and there are unfinished statues as the one that you see here with a small detail that has to be completed. But in addition to these statues, there are other statues that, as Van Voorhis has uh, argued convincing, convincingly in the publication of the workshop, they bear so many tool traces and so unrelated to each other that do not correspond to any given stage of the sculpting scene of the retoir, we like or we don't like the expression of the sculpting process, if you wish. And there are also details like uh, what appears to be too right fit. So Van Voorhis has uh, uh, very convincingly argued that this is a training piece for apprentices who are trying their tools and processes in this uh, piece of uh, uh, sculpture which was never finished. There are other examples, as these uh, are, are said to be an unfinished statue of a uh, yacht from Rimia, uh, close to Vilos, but it can be also a training piece, as it brings, it, it bears all kinds of uh, sculpting tools not corresponding really to, to uh, a stage of the sculpting process. In a different uh, um, context, uh, uh, at my known Maya, the city of Maya, which also uh, Sarah and Julia spoke about, uh, dating to the 18th century, this uh, sealstone workshop has been found and it is definitely a workshop because there are bronze and uh, bone tools as well as finished and unfinished artifacts. There's no doubt that this is a workshop. In this workshop, the excavator has identified on the basis of style uh, um, seals that uh, are at, uh, he has attributed to apprentices. Uh, and uh, you can see some of these uh, here, which differ from more uh, developed uh, um, seals. There's no doubt that a, a technical analysis would reveal more uh, pieces, would attribute more pieces uh, to apprentices, like badly broken seals, broken in ways that a professional would never do, uh, and also failed drillings. And a drilling is a very simple thing that you learn at the very beginning. You don't fail. So this is certainly a training piece. It's not a fail piece. It's a training piece. So what we have, and uh, we have discussed this uh, uh, again and again in this uh, uh, seminar, the, in, the, in the level of, of uh, training, what is important is the repetition of movements and, uh, and uh, methods and practice until they become embodied know-how. Uh, as Trevor said at the beginning of today's uh, meeting, trial and error, the mistake, the error is the best teacher of the craftsman and also the archaeologist, as we argue. 
So you have to, to, to make mistakes and break seals in order to learn how to make them. But this process has a given end. So there is the gradual acquisition of standard skills, how to learn to make uh, a, a ship on a sail. That's it. You are not expected to be, uh, how to say, the master. Okay, so this, uh, the intersubjective relation here is unidirectional from the teachers or from the masters to the apprentices. And the whole idea is to take uh, on standard knowledge, become it embodied uh, know-how to there is a level. So here, skill is externally uh, defined, is defined by the teacher. He will or she will judge whether an apprentice has become a skilled craftsman. Okay, now let's go to creative work innovation, which one would argue is the situation is completely different. And we learned this while studying uh, in the National Museum of Athens and in other museums around the world. Uh, together with Dr. Eleni Kostantinidis, which is a, a, um, a, an integral part of uh, uh, this project, we were studying um, uh, a very rare and demanding gold working technique, Mycenaean technique, so 17th, 16th century BC, uh, for the decoration of prestigious weapons. And the technique focused on, on the application of thousands of minute L shaped bars, less than three millimeter long on the organic hills and pommels of weapons. And once this was uh, uh, covered, then it was decorated with engraved spirals, as you can see in the photos. Now, uh, this required a tremendous amount of time. Okay, see here you can see the uh, finished, uh, finished and well-preserved pommel from the, uh, from the bra. And on the right, you can see almost 5,000 of these uh, uh, tiny bars. Now, the, uh, the work was minute and required the pre-drilling of tiny holes on, on ivory or bone and then the very careful placement of these tiny pieces one next to another in a brickwork pattern and then the burnishing of this material so that at the end, uh, in, the, in the upper surface, what people looked at, one could not recognize that that consisted of different parts apart from when the object uh, was corroded. Up to now, only 20 examples of this technique uh, are known and they spread over two or perhaps three centuries. Most of them come from the side of Mycenae. Because of uh, this distribution, because also of the homogeneity and standardization of the, of the technique, it seems that there are very few workshops or even artisans, perhaps one or two were my theme, which of course poses interesting questions of how this knowledge was transmitted, because these uh, techniques, was, these kind of uh, weapons were found only in very rich tombs, royal tombs, like, tombs of very high status individuals. And so uh, they had to make these probably very expensive uh, 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 weapons uh, only when a ruler died or somebody of very high status. Uh, so this can happen five, six times, four, five times in the life of a, of a craftsman. Now, the interesting thing that uh, uh, there was evolution in this technique. Okay, uh, so starting from simple linear motifs on uh, the uh, organic uh, background, then using these gold bars in order to make uh, decorative motifs themselves, okay, spirals and then ending with dressing the whole uh, handle with uh, gold and then engraving, now engraving, okay, not uh, doing uh, in relief as before. And not only the design change, but also the, the very uh, medium. So the gold bars were very uh, unstandardized at the beginning and became very homogeneous in the later part of this technique. So there was a clear evolution of the technique, which is really incomprehensible given that a sword of that style, as you can see on the left, didn't uh, appear at all different from a sword decorated with simple gold seed, as you see on the right. On the left is the gold embroidery, on the right is the gold seed. So the question here is why somebody would, would make such improvements. And uh, we tried to understand this with Akis, uh, who worked over the past two years and after we have studied a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, objects. Uh, um, 
and he was trying to, to, to understand this technique, not to reproduce it, to understand it. So uh, he would like to share his experience. Now, improvement of, of manual skills was not an important thing. I mean, he's an experienced and very good professional. How, how much can his uh, movements or hands improve? I mean, there was nothing improving in his manual skills, really. Okay, or just a few improvements. What improved really was his visual perception of the of the, uh, uh, of the object. So while at the beginning he was looking at the regularities on the transit object, on the patterns, on the overall perfection, and he was trying, as he said, and he will say later, he was trying to replicate, it, to repeat it. Then he started looking more closely in a very high resolution and identifying problems, the minor errors, the errors that Trevor said earlier, these errors that teach us how this was made. So here added stripes in places that something went wrong and he had to, to, to fill that. I mean, he didn't throw away. I mean, this is not a, rare, a, a fatal error. It's all these kind of errors that help and then you fix. Or errors in the way uh, uh, the, the uh, motives were engraved. So there is an obvious problem here, if you see with high magnification, of course, in the tool that engraves this kind of thing. And this, in a mind like, uh, I guess like a person, it creates questions, it's a challenge. It asks for solutions. And solution is innovation. And in order to bring uh, these solutions, you have also to find tools. So before saying this, uh, uh, please, please let me show you our early experimental efforts. So we're trying to do this thing, but the results were unsatisfactory or even lamentable. And this was because the, the, we didn't make good use of the, of the wire to produce these uh, gold bars. It was too loose. And this is when I just decided to start making, uh, and also to, to observe, first of all, closely, more closely the um, object itself and also to start making his uh, own uh, uh, tools and also to think about the design. So how he placed things on, or he, how the ancient uh, uh, cross and place things on, on the surface. Okay, so how he organized his, his uh, movement. Uh, and for that, then he started making his own uh, tools uh, uh, according to the problems that he had identified already. So tweezers, cutting chisels, drills, minute size, all of them, pressing tools, burnishers, and so on. And then he started making the, his, uh, uh, um, working his material with these tools. So making the, the gold bars with uh, sharper nails, finding a way to bend, which in such minute dimensions is very difficult. Um, uh, tools in order to press this thing on the surface and stay there. And finally, tools in order to flatten and homogenize this uh, surface. Okay, and these new tools created new technical affordances, which made earlier techniques he had used look completely redundant. So what looked really, uh, how to say, interesting and revolutionary uh, two years ago, now it looked completely fashioned and was abandoned. So the technical affordance is, is an important thing here. And uh, in the states that uh, are, he is now, he has created experimental pieces like the ones that you see on the left, which do not claim the mastery of the Mycenaean craftsman, but they show the same technical um, details so the, this flattening of the of the heads and the way that uh, the, the uh, engravings are made. So he's much closer now into the the process and the technique than it was uh, before. Uh, this whole process has been governed by problem solving mentality, and this is something that I think that everybody has uh, uh, mentioned this today. If there is a kind of intersubjective relation here, this is a dialogic relation, a dialogue of tradition. So the modern craftsman is a bit what, what uh, Nadia said earlier, that the modern craftsman is in a dialogue with past craftsmen. He is identifying, his, he first admires, or she first admires their work, and then he identifies problems as he gets more into it, as he gets a deeper visual perception. And of course, mental perception of that. And then he identifies problems that becomes a challenge and the challenge is called for solution. 
So to summarize, uh, William, through his work, is that manual abilities were refined with time, but not much. What increased substantially was visual perception. Technical advances required the creation of new tools, uh, creation of new tools, okay. Uh, and work was governed by the desire to solve problems. So what we can suggest out of this presentation is skill is very differently defined here in this um, expert literacy work than in training. Skill here is related with the creation of new technical affordances. This is the challenge for the, for the crusher, create new technical possibilities. And this equates with innovation, but innovation is by definition a relational concept. As Akis Boomer says in our discussion, at this level of expertise, the most important tool is the human mind. So we come back into McQueen's definition that uh, um, skill is a, a complex in which manual skill plays only part. And this is particularly true when we speak with or very experienced um, uh, crushing. And uh, what we, we try to emphasize here to, to identify is the need to approach skill as a relational uh, quality. So here we have to thank uh, a lot of people for this uh, uh, study, of course, who had found uh, to study uh, materials in the museums. Uh, I would like to thank you. And in case you are interested or we have time, we have a three minutes uh, video which shows all this uh, uh, process. I think it is interesting. I don't know if we have time. And we have also the small problem that because this is copyrighted material, it cannot be uh, recorded. So if we want to um, um, show, we will have to stop recording for a moment. Thank you very much. Sorry. Um, thank you so much, Akis and Nikos, for the presentation and bringing mind and uh, discursive ideas also more, again, more into the play, which is we sometimes seem to forget it a bit. Uh, I'm sure that there are questions and a lot of questions, probably. I'm especially interested in these creative process. So there are different, um, you say your skill is relational, um, which is also, yeah, as a bit as Ingold has said it, we have all these relations to the environment, to the tools. And this is exactly where it becomes interesting. You start to develop something new out of the process of doing something, you create a new mm -hmm. tool and we have really a completely new process and to, to trace that in the archaeological record is extremely interesting and congratulations to, for that. I think Aideen has a question. Aideen? I'm sorry that I have questions again. It's, it's a topic that is really interesting me a lot and so I, I, I can't hold myself for the final discussion, sorry. Um, I'm really interested in the aspect of tools and tool making by actually by the craftsperson him or herself, um, is that traceable in a wider range? Because I've been, there are, there are these, there was the, the WDR, the, the Westdeutsche Rundfunk had been making a, a series of, I don't know, it's basically 50, 60 um, um, documentaries about craftspersons in Germany doing crafts that are slowly dying out. And in some cases one finds it that it's very important for the for the for the craftspersons to make their tools themselves, like blacksmiths making their own hammers and their own pinches, as apprentices, then to work with these for basically the rest of their lives because they are they are basically they are part of their extended body. You know what Ingold is talking about talking about. Sorry. So um, is that traceable in in like for example in the, at the site of the the, the the stonemasons um, that they are making their own tools close by? As far as I know, uh, and then uh, uh, I will come to the 
to our uh, thing. Uh, no, there is no anything like, uh, uh, I, I don't recall having found anything like, you know, a metalsmith uh, thing. Uh, and these, of, of course, doesn't mean that all tools are custom made. So uh, perhaps uh, when it comes to, to something which is uh, widely performed, like sculpture, I would suppose that there are specialized works or smiths who are making uh, sculpting tools. When you're doing something which is so unique, and okay, I'm saying this unique, we have found 20, okay, maybe this is one tenth of the whole production over two centuries, but even if you have 200, it's still too little. Then there is no need for, for uh, standardized tools. Uh, and since we have been working with these kind of techniques, we, Akis was working with, with a, a different cold breaking technique of, the, of that time, and he suggested uh, uh, he was working on something that we need to make circles. But he observed that the circles, if we use a compass, they have a specific section that it was not apparent on the object. He suggested then that you, you don't have a compass, but you have a, a, a tool with two vertical points that go just like that. And we said, but we don't know this kind of thing. And then we're discussing, then in the National Museum, there was a colleague said, ah, I have found this in the, somewhere, I don't remember, in Macedonia, and I didn't know what it is. If we consider how many objects, metal objects, or stone objects, or bone objects, we have not identified as something, it is possible that these are custom-made tools in a way. And if you see the, the bone tools that he's using, I would never recognize them as tools in excavation. So it may be uh, traceable if we start making this discussion. If we start making discussion that not everything is classic, uh, typified and standardized, but there are things that may be custom-made, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Trevor has a comment onto the topic. Ah, here it is. I'm here. Thanks for a really great paper. I enjoyed that a lot. And I, I, I like the way that you emphasized um, mistakes and having to make corrections and the whole kind of focus on finding solutions to problems. And we often create our problems in order to innovate. And I just wanted to comment on, I think this very interesting um, issue about tool making or um, you know, innovating in tool making. Um, I can't talk about it from an archeological context. I don't know enough about it, but I do know that in the contemporary craft context, craftspeople are always repurposing their tools. And in fact, there are carpenters that I know that will make new tools and some of them have even done it purposely in order to push their own techniques to explore new ways of working their materials. They're exceptions, obviously. They enjoy the experiment of working with tools and materials. But if they exist now, why would those people not have existed in the past? It's that kind of cognitive, cognitive challenge that we, um, that we present to ourselves. So anyways, I, I, I very much enjoyed the fact that you brought in the role of the tool, repurposing tools and creating new tools all those things play a big part, I think, in the uh, in the craft process and knowledge making. So thanks thank for that. You, thank you very much. I would, uh, if you don't mind, I would ask Akis to, to comment on this because you know I've learned these kind of things. I'm I'm the the speaker. I mean, it's his knowledge. It's not mine. So Akis, please. Can you hear me? It's okay. Yes. Uh, thank you. I would feel better if there are more craftsmen in this conversation <laughs> and to share more experience. But uh, I want to thank the archaeologists because uh, without archaeologists, I couldn't have all this knowledge. I have changed my mind of looking to things and I have learned how to learn from an object. Before working with archaeologists, I couldn't understand what it was meaning, what the meaning of this. So what we're looking for is what we can learn from what we have, we have in front of our hands. So uh i believe i'm talking about the tools i believe that we are a tool as a, as a body so in order to express ourselves we have to make a tool which is extension of our body and of our mind so we can use a tool which is productive or if we buy it we have to change it so in order to to learn all this uh, 
how things were done. We're working with Nikos from 2006, 2007, I think. And uh, I have learned something that uh, it's not easy to understand it when you are a craftsman. You ha I had to forget what I knew as a goldsmith. So I had to learn from the beginning from my errors, from the mistakes I made. So I had to develop my movement and my movement had to develop my tools. And then it's all, everything was coming one after the other. And uh, I feel lucky for this because I learned it only from you, only from the knowledge you shared, Nikos, Eleni, and all of you uh, with uh, craftsmen. It's, uh, you feel that you, you, uh, the craftsman is useful for you, but uh, I believe you are very useful for craftsmen too, because it helps us to go back. We to go back because we lose many of the uh, knowledge uh, uh, old car past craftsmen had. So working with a craftsman, working with an archaeologist, craftsmen go back and understand something which they, are, they have lost. So this, for me, it's very important and it has uh, influenced my work, my life, and uh, I have changed many things because of that. So in order to understand this uh, uh, craftsman better, I had to change also my personal work. Uh, last three years, I tried, to, I changed everything and I tried to work in very, very small dimensions to understand why he develops himself and for a very, very different start here uh, at the 15th century, he found out this, uh, gold embroidery as we saw the last uh, uh, artifacts. So if I compare my work three years ago and now I see these differences because this work is like diving in yourself. It's like learning yourself better through everything, through the tools, through the movement, through the problems you face. And uh, this is why I feel so lucky. Thank you all. It's, I don't know if I have any, anything else to say. And also I feel honored to be between you and uh, uh, to share what you know. You, you, you talk about things which is very useful for craftsmen to hear about. Thank I'm you. I'm very glad that because slowly we have the impression that we get more and more useless as archaeologists, but we might have a reason <laughs> at least to communicate it to other people and to, to learn so many things from, from craftspeople and being... So luckily we still have sense. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Akit. Thank uh, you. Shall we get, um, is there an, another short comment? Otherwise, we, I also like to ask a question to Arkis. Uh, this is Michael, I can't see him. Uh, here, here he is, please. Yes, uh, I think that was a wonderful, wonderful presentation indeed, showing very well uh, how important it is to uh, incorporate expert craftspeople uh, to also- uh, I'm sorry, but I, I don't feel expert. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like it. I, I know so small things and I, I, yes, I, okay. I yeah, admire, yeah. Michael, I admire your work. I found, I saw you in Madrid some years ago. Well, and I said, I'm sure ah. you're more expert than the archaeologists themselves, but in one way it's sort of extremely helpful is because it's really, it helps us to, for instance, recognize these very inconspicuous tools that we wouldn't even think about as part of the craft. That will be just one example. But um, my question to you is actually on, a, uh, on something else. I'm, I'm interested in knowing how much sort of reflection is part of your um, development of skills. So when you are trying to sort of understand these, these, um, the skill of em embroidery with gold work and you're trying this, then, then how much do you reflect actually on that uh, process and how does that help you to develop uh, these skills? 
Uh, I spent hours and hours of observing the items, hours of dreaming, how things were working on the, uh, uh, in his environment. Look, I am trying to open a dialogue with this uh, old craftsman. So I just guess, and uh, there are, uh, sometimes I need some months to answer a question or find out why he was doing this. Uh, I don't know if I have a, a very good answer to your question because the difference is that a craft, uh, things work very differently for the craftsman than in a scientist. Uh, for us, things work from inside to outside and sometimes we don't think about them. We, th we think about them when we see the results on the surfaces, on the object we are making. So this is a very good conversation between scientists and craftsmen to, to see, uh, to find uh, and walk, try to walk in the same path than in parallel paths which never uh, find each other. For me, uh, this is important. This is why with Nikos and Eleni, we are working so many years together so we are walking in the, may, in the same path. Uh, we grow up. We grow up together, as uh, Nadia wrote. It's uh, it's something which uh, or Celine, I don't remember. But I don't know if I if you had the, the answer you wanted, uh, Michael. It's a big conversation. Maybe it's not an answer for this uh, question. But if, if I can just add an information for Michael, uh, yesterday or last week anyway, Agus told me, you don't know how much my mind has cleared after the excursion I did to Pylos. He had gone a couple of weeks in Pylos and on the mountains there. And he said, I thought a lot there and I had a much clearer idea about this technique. So that, that probably says that there was quite a lot of reflection and certainly there's a lot of discussion. 